Greetings from Tokyo, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very much hope that this video finds you well and in very, very good spirits wherever you are in the world. And today, if you don't mind, I would very much like to share with you some thoughts and comments that I have with regard to one of the recent releases made by the Criterion Collection during this year of 2020. And that release is the film which has been designated the spine number of 1059. It is a film from 1996, and the name of the filmmaker is David Cronenberg. The title of the film is Crash. This is the film from 1996, based on, or perhaps inspired by, the work by J.G. Ballard, and of course the film is by David Cronenberg. This is of course the very profound and provocative work called Crash. Now before I go any further, let me say that what we have here is the Criterion Blu-ray release, uh, but I have the back cover, not the front cover, but the back cover shown here for purposes of this video. And uh, I have this uh, situated like this because later on I will talk about certain aspects of the cover art. Uh, with regard to this Criterion release. But for uh, the time being, if you don't mind, please let me now share with you some thoughts that I have about the film Crash uh, with this particular setup and the Blu-ray. And as I say, I will make some further explorations and discussions of the Criterion release specifically in the latter half of this video. If we were to try to focus in on the plot or narrative essence of the film, uh, what to say? Uh, it's a film that focuses in on a set of characters, and these characters are currently uh, undergoing a sort of journey into their own human sexuality, or to be more specific, the reaches and extents and boundaries by which their own sexual appetites and desires and needs either can or cannot be satiated. And if they cannot be satiated, then what is the way in which these people, these characters, can find some kind of sexual satisfaction? This exploration of human sexuality is set against the backdrops of many different thematic structures, one of which is the concept or the metaphor of the car or the automobile. We have connections made between human interaction and cars and how the vehicle uh, and perhaps specifically the vehicle as engaged in certain situations involving car crashes, how this has some kind of direct or metaphorical connection with this human sexuality exploration of these characters. So that's one aspect. Another aspect is the, uh, the idea or concept of uh, human connection and uh, human desire, but also sexuality as, uh, as presented perhaps in many different uh, viewpoints or formats. Human sexuality as a type of, of biological, mechanical function of human existence. Also, it is a means by which people connect and how they connect and what is the emotional connection that is generated that I think is also at the heart of this film which is exploring, as I say, the, uh, this human sexuality side. So I think there are a lot of layers already at stake when we are uh, exploring and discussing and uh, grappling with the uh, types of conversations that are uh, present in a, a context of a film like Crash. So, uh, first of all, if we were to consider the discussion of the film's usage of sexuality and sexual exploration vis-a-vis -vis cars and car crashes, let's take the concept of the crash 
specifically, which is, of course, the title of the work and also the film. I think we can see uh, a lot of potential interpretations that could come about. So one possible interpretation that I think is very reasonable is if we consider the concept of the car crash, if we remember that the car crash itself is a very violent event, it is an event that uh, it potentially involves significant physical injury or death, as well as uh, property damage with regard to the car itself and any effects or any uh, belongings that are contained within the car. So it is a very significant event on all fronts, and it could be something that is uh, on a disturbing level directly related or linked to the notion of death. And in that case, if we have the concept of car crashes defined with those parameters, and if we have a film that arguably could be interpreted to be a film where we have characters that might be exploring their sexualities vis-a-vis -vis car crashes and simulated car crashes, etc., then I think a possible interpretation could be that, at least for some characters, the concept of sexuality, human sexuality, equals, to some degree, the concept of death. And so, uh, to put it broadly, sex equals death. And I think if we have a, an interpretation of the film on those terms, I think we can see the potential avenues uh, that this kind of interpretation uh, can lead us down. It can be, for example, a cynical view of human nature and the uh, cynical nature by which human sexuality can or cannot be progressed on a level or a degree that the characters are seeking. Or this could be a, an alternative, excuse me, this could lead to an alternative interpretation, I would suggest, which is that uh, if we take a step back and we think about the concept of not car crashes per se, although it is relevant, but if we think about the concept of the car and the automobile and the vehicle and how the car itself seems to be the subject of its own sort of uh, fetishization within the parameters of the characters in the film and the, the world that the film creates, I think we can also uh, derive a, an interpretation wherein we see the car as a metaphor for the human condition and the physical existence of human beings. After all, the car itself is a mechanism by which people uh, drive uh, as a sort of function of mobility and movement. It thus becomes also an extension of one's own personality and one's own character. And if we can see, therefore, a car as an extension of oneself, then I think that leads very, I think very poetically into a discussion of how human functions can be reflected into the extension of, of uh, uh, human functionality that we see outside of the body. In other words, say, human functions like sexuality that exist within the body can also be reflected in externalities that are extensions of the body. So sexuality within can, for example, be reflected, say, in an external thing like a car. And so this connection of sexuality, human existence, and externalities, using the car as a central metaphor, I think is very powerful and dynamic. And it leads to many implications, possible implications at least. For example, what does it mean to try to, say, compare human sexuality to, say, aspects of the car or functionalities of the car, metaphorically speaking? Does that say something about the body biological nature of sexuality. After all, uh, human sexuality is in and of itself a process. It is a functional process which is biological and mechanical, much like the mechanics of, say, an external, an external thing like a car itself. And so what does that say about a sort of reflection or a comment, if you will, on the nature of human biology? It doesn't necessarily have to be a cynical negative take, though, of course, because uh, there are a lot of, say, benefits 
to externalities and uh, things that have a certain practical function, like cars or other mechanical devices. And so uh, this type of uh, discussion of the reflection of, of human sexuality as made manifest outwardly in, say, something like a, the metaphor of a car, I think can lead to a, very, uh, a myriad of different possibilities, perhaps um, some on the cynical side, but even uh, other discussions on the opposite end, end of the spectrum on a more positive or transparent transcendental uh, uh, viewpoint. In, in other words, human the, the boundaries of the uh, biological condition of uh, the human being are, um, are sort of uh, um, are extended upon or there is a sort of uh, uh, a degree of transcendental uh, extension that is uh, made manifest outside the body in the metaphor of the car. So I think that can lead also to some very uh, interesting implications that are of, say, uh, an, an evolution type of of a discussion or the idea of, of human connection and biology and the extension and uh, progression thereof. So I think those possibilities are there, at least in an interpretive discussion of the film in these aspects. Related to that, of course, is I think what is often used in the context of David Cronenberg's filmography, uh, past and present. As we may know, David Cronenberg is a filmmaker who has made some incredibly important, very stimulating, very interesting works of art. Uh, and a lot of his works of art uh, have been described with the phrase uh, that is often used, which is body horror. And while I wouldn't claim to be, in any sense of the phrase, any kind of Cronenberg expert, my general understanding of the phrase body horror in the context of a discussion of Cronenberg's films is that it is that way of describing certain situations that confront uh, or that otherwise uh, are uh, present with specific characters and situations of the various plots of Cronenberg's works, where we have human beings that seem to, due to some kind of event of plot or narrative or stress or emotional turmoil or the like, positive or negative, some kind of stressful situation leads, therefore, to some kind of physical manifestation of the body that leads to a change. And whenever we have what's known as a biological change or change based on the, uh, uh, the physiological or the biological, that in turn has implications because anything that inc involves change means destroying the old for the sake of the new. Right, destroying what's old for the sake of the changed form. And that violence or that destruction is oftentimes the subject of, say, uh, some of the quote-unquote horror aspects of David Cronenberg's works. Thus, the word horror is introduced, and it's involved with the body, the idea of change, and thus the word body is introduced. Thus, the phrase body horror, which to conclude, in my view, uh, can be used to describe any kind of situation where there is a, st uh, a state of human existence that is undergoing change due to some kind of emotional state of mind or being. Okay, And whatever that manifestation is, is the context of that particular film. Here in Crash, I think the same type of concept is at play most vividly, most strikingly, because if we think about the characters and their explorations of their own human sexualities vis-a-vis -vis themselves and each other and their own inner circle, uh, I think we can see characters perhaps trying to find answers to their questions on this journey that are not necessarily present in their current state of being. In other words, they seem to be searching for things that are outside of their current state of being. So they need to change or they need to undergo some kind of transformation that could be physical. And indeed, we see some characters in Crash that seem to have undergone a kind of physical change due to some specific circumstances that lead them down a path to uh, different forms or expressions of their human sexuality. So I think in that sense, it is linked to this concept of quote-unquote body horror that we have seen applied in past Cronenberg's films. But also we see the change applied in other physical 
uh, circumstances uh, made manifest in the way in which these uh, characters um, are engaging with each other and also experiencing bodily change uh, that could be linked directly to the notion of cars and car crashes. So again, we have this concept of the human transformation made manifest in some kind of physical form or circumstance due to a emotional state of mind that is linked to the exploration of human sexuality. And in that way, this is wholly consistent with the type of films and uh, that are existent in the filmography of David Cronenberg uh, so vividly and so strikingly. Uh, and so I, I find this to be uh, a fascinating example of a Cronenberg film. And also, uh, I should say too that this is a film that because it's a film that I would suggest is focusing in on characters exploring their sexualities, it is a film that, of course, depicts situations of human sexuality and the act uh, between human beings. In that way, of course, it is a film whose content is definitely not for everyone. It has, uh, admittedly, situations that are very direct and very graphic in a lot of aspects. And so it is certainly not for everyone, and I wouldn't expect it to be. Indeed, also, if we recall the the type of reception that the film received from certain circles of the critics and journalists and the media, I think we can understand that due to its content, there was a, a quite an uproar in some circles about the nature of how sex was depicted in a film like this. I would say that uh, the film, however, uh, is ultimately an exploration of human sexuality and therefore it focuses in on the act of sex in the context of human drama. After all, if we were to think that human drama is in essence the depiction of characters and how characters interact with each other, communicate with each other, collide with each other, clash with each other on an emotional level or sometimes on a physical level, I think we can say also that depictions of sex, and in the context of this film for sure, depictions of sex can also be said therefore to be expressions of human drama. Because after all, what is a sex? What is the act of sex? When we think about it in the context of this film, it could be said to be the way in which human beings are trying to communicate with each other. They are trying to connect with each other in one of the ultimate forms of this type of human connection that is possible on a biological level. And so, and then through that connection, we see how they interact, how they are, uh, how they uh, maybe uh, are communicating with each other, or how there is a difference of, of uh, state of minds between the, the participants, etc. And so in this way, this, this act becomes a yet another way to express human drama and emotional connections and physical connections because after all as i say that seems to be the essence of human drama and through that rubric i think we can also therefore identify that this film crash through its depictions of sexuality is ultimately about how human beings are trying to find connections with each other how it is they're trying to find their place in this world by connecting with others vis-a-vis uh, -vis their conceptions of themselves. In that context, therefore, these scenes become integral in a, an emotional storyline that involves, say, maybe how two characters, two main characters in the film, are trying to connect with each other on an emotional level. I mean, another way to describe that in genre term, terms would be like a love story. And so uh, we see how many characters are, in essence, trying to find human connection. And uh, the way it's described and expressed is through the act of sexuality, but it's either through the act itself or the consequences of those acts that we see how this progresses. And so I think ultimately this is a story of human drama and the, the uh, various uh, the various uh, uh, ways in which that human drama is progressed. And ultimately, of course, if we think about it too, David Cronenberg's films, past and present, have always been at their hearts films with human drama in them. 
And even with human drama, we see change, we see evolution, we see progress, uh, which is in a way like the arc of drama from point A to point B. And in the world of David Cronenberg, it could be described as being, say, body horror, uh, biological transformation, etc. But those are also examples of change. And sex is also the example of connection and human interaction. Human intera interaction, connection, change, those seem to me uh, the elements, the essential elements of what makes up great human drama. Thus, the film Crash becomes, the, uh, uh, becomes a setting for this human drama that's played out between and among these various characters, making for incredibly compelling and oftentimes uh, quite moving, challenging, potentially disturbing, also poetic, uh, and very beautiful uh, depictions of these journeys that these various characters are currently uh, undergoing and progressing through. This is a brilliant work of art on many levels, and I'm so glad it is back in the Criterion Collection. This is David Cronenberg's Crash. So, with those comments, I'd like to now turn to the specific aspects of this Criterion Collection Blu-ray release from earlier this year, 2020. Now, as some of you may already know, this is a very interesting release for a number of reasons, one of which being that uh, at or around the same time that Criterion released this, Arrow, uh, in fact, released its own version or versions of this uh, physical media release. And indeed, Arrow's packaging and also Arrow's presentation includes the possibility of a UHD 4K uh, presentation release. So for anyone who is able to avail himself or herself to the, uh, the region-based, a uh, Blu-ray region-based Arrow release, and anyone who might be interested in the 4K uh, physical media possibilities that that entails, and anyone who might be interested in the supplements that are included in the Arrow presentation, uh, which are uh, different than, for the most part, different than what we get for the Criterion release, then perhaps the Arrow release is uh, to your liking, and you might prefer the Arrow release over this Criterion release. And so whatever the situation for you, my friends, as the ultimate uh, decision maker in the consumer process, uh, just please keep that in mind. Um, in fact, I, I, I think that the Arrow release is uh, definitely worthy, and uh, it was my intention uh, upon making this video to try to make some kind of comparison between the Arrow release and this Criterion release. Unfortunately, due to timing and also to, due to delivery, uh, delivery circumstances, uh, such Arrow release has not yet arrived, and there is a little bit of a delay in the shipment to Japan here. And so I'm not able, I'm sorry, to be able to make a comparison. Maybe in another video I might be able to do that once it arrives. But uh, just please keep that in mind. Again, for some people, the Arrow release might be the preferred option over the Criterion release. But for now, let us focus on what we have here, which is the Criterion release that was released in North America. And with that, I should say, too, that the uh, before I go any further, I should address what is uh, very apparent here, which is the fact that I don't have the front cover showing of the Criterion release. Now, if I were to try to explain why, it would be that, well, let me not just cover it up like this, there is a particular aspect of the cover that is very uh, uh, interesting, to say the least. And I have it covered up in the bottom corner here. Um, the reason why I am a little bit hesitant to show this particular cover art for purposes of this YouTube video is this. When the film was announced uh, some months back, I had the opportunity to look at the cover art uh, online. And uh, I wasn't quite sure, to be perfectly honest, what to make of it. Then, when the actual Blu-ray arrived at my house, uh, and I saw the cover art up close, I thought, oh, this is a very interesting cover art design, except for one little detail. Now, this detail is that what I am uh, hesitant to show is the fact that there seems to be, in one corner, this depiction of two human bodies which seem to be engaged in or perhaps almost engaged in some kind of act of human sexuality. And so um, I, as I was trying to indicate earlier, 
I have absolutely nothing against the way in which sexuality is depicted in this film. On the contrary, I think it is a brilliant depiction and a great discussion of this essential aspect of human existence, namely uh, sex lives and, and uh, identities forged within one's own conception of human sex and sexuality. So I, and I think it serves the function of the film so beautifully and so poetically on a number of levels, which I've tried to expre express earlier in this video. So I have nothing against the film on, on that respect at all. Uh, however, there is something to be said about the fact that sometimes this content is not for everyone. And even, uh, I mean, very direct depictions of sexuality, I think, um, very reasonably so, aren't for everyone. And uh, I think, therefore, one has to positively choose to watch a film like Crash, positively pull out the Blu-ray, put it in the player, or press play in order to engage in the work. So there's no pressure from the outset, but one needs to uh, actively make the choice to want to watch it. If we have, even, uh, even in one corner of the cover art, if we have something that is suggestive or very directly of some kind of act of human sexuality, then I think we're getting into territory that I'm not sure I'm 100% with because cover art is not always something that we can control. Um, so it's, and again, for some people, this type of depiction is okay in and of itself. And I, for one, am in that, in, in that camp. But when it comes to how it's presented, then I have to say uh, it would have been perhaps a little bit preferable if Criterion or the powers that be uh, showed a little bit more maybe restraint in withholding this kind of direct depiction. Let me put it that way. And so for those reasons, I think while I am on board in terms of the specific content, what it is I think the, the art is trying to depict and how it ties directly with the themes of the film, which as I say, are brilliant. Maybe it didn't need to be on the front cover of the Criterion Blu-ray, let me put it that way. So uh, that's why I've decided for this presentation. And again, you may disagree with me, uh, but as I say, I'm not uh, in disagreement as far as the depiction and its thematic significance, but I'm just uh, uh, questioning whether or not it could have been, say, on a, uh, in some kind of aspect other than the front cover of a Criterion Blu-ray. But that's all I'm saying. So that's why I'm choosing uh, to have this Blu-ray facing uh, back cover uh, instead of the front cover. But uh, as I say, I do want to emphasize that uh, with those reservations, I do think that the cover art itself is very indicative and very directly relevant to the notion of the themes of the film, as I was trying to express earlier in this video. So uh, bravo to that cover art for capturing the essence of that. I'm, I'm very appreciative of this. But with those comments out of the way, let me now say that uh, what we have here in the Criterion presentation, as far as the supplements are concerned, are uh, very interesting in and of themselves. First, we have the 1997 audio commentary from David Cronenberg himself. This is significant because, first of all, it's the same commentary track that we saw on the earlier, much earlier, Criterion Laserdisc release of Crash. It is a brilliant commentary. And in fact, I think it is one of the key reasons to try to at least consider getting the Criterion release over other releases because of the inclusion of the Cronenberg commentary track. It is essential. Let me say that again. The Cronenberg commentary track is essential. There is this demeanor and soft-spoken nature of Cronenberg, as he always does in all the interviews and all the lectures that he has given. And he is very direct, very specific about certain situations of the film, and I appreciate that 1,000%. He also gives very interesting anecdotal information and, and bits of, of trivia about the film. He's also talking about working with the actors, working in these uh, situations, and what it was actually like on the production and the like. And also he speaks about the, uh, the critical reaction, the press reaction, etc. 
and uh, the aftermath of this and what it was he was trying to portray vis-a-vis the Ballard work. And that's another point that's really interesting about this commentary. There are moments where he goes into specific detail comparing and contrasting the film with the underlying Ballard work. And this is fascinating too for anyone who knows the Ballard work. And I strongly suggest for anyone who is uh, who is uh, interested in this uh, subject matter of Crash, uh, and if you haven't read the, the work by J.G. Ballard, I strongly recommend that you do. It is a, it's in and of itself, it is so fascinating and so profound. Uh, but Cronenberg, I think, uh, lends his insight so well in the context of that discussion during various points of the commentary track. So this is an example of why I think, once again, the Cronenberg commentary track that's included, it's from 1997, but it's included here as an option for the Criterion release. This is essential. And this is one of the reasons why I think anyone should at least consider getting the Criterion version uh, over, say, other versions. But that's not all, because we also get uh, what is known as Ballard and Cronenberg, which is the 1996 BFI BFI Guardian Lecture, uh, moderated and attended by Chris Rodley. I understand this is also made available elsewhere, but it's great to have it here by Criterion. It's very long. It's an hour and 41 minutes or so, so excellent length, fantastic. The two of them, or the three of them, are talking, and it gives Cronenberg and Ballard the opportunity to discuss the film, and also Ballard gives his his praiseworthy insights into the specifics as to why the film works for him. And that discussion is so valuable. And also there are insights into how the the book and the film are related or are not related. And that leads again to another way in which these supplements lend to the conversation of book and film, which is, as I say, an integral discussion for anyone who's interested in the subject matter of Crash. Uh, I would say also, perhaps as on a technical level, uh, there are no chapter breaks in this presentation supplement by Criterion. Because of its length, it's, it's an hour and 40 minutes or so, I think it would have benefited also from having chapter breaks. But no matter, because uh, you're still getting the, the essence of the lecture or the talk itself, which is, as I'm trying to suggest, brilliant. So please check it out if you, if you can. But that's not all, because then we get... Uh, the Cannes Press Conference, um, which is approximately 37 minutes. Here we have uh, the film which was shown at Cannes, the Cannes Film Festival, and uh, we have the press conference and where we have uh, critics and journalists uh, asking questions and to the conference participants and these are these include David Cronenberg uh, some of the actors as well um, uh, James Spader Holly Hunter um, uh, Elias uh, Kateas and uh, Rosanna Arquette, etc., uh, uh, Deborah Kara Unger, and also the producers, uh, Jeremy Thomas, etc. So uh, th- these uh, participants are fielding questions, and this is so fascinating. Now, uh, as it has been indicated um, uh, in other aspects of discussions of this film, both uh, current and uh, uh, archival, One of the things uh, that is uh, connected with this film is the reaction, the critical reaction at the time. And uh, as you can imagine, it was quite uh, uh, turbulent and tumultuous from certain circles because of its subject matter. And uh, we get a sense of that in this Cannes press conference. Some of the questions I think are very positive uh, towards the film. Other questions I think are quite critical. And it's interesting to see David Cronenberg and company react to these questions, either through their direct responses or maybe in a look in their face. There are some moments where we see some of the actors uh, quite visibly maybe perplexed at how certain questions or comments are phrased. So that in and of itself is a very uh, interesting detail. Uh, But these all go into a discussion of how the film was, um, uh, uh, was discussed. And so... Uh, I think that in and of itself is uh, very uh, essential as far as, say, a historical discussion of the Cannes Film Festival vis-a-vis Crash and also a discussion of the critical reception and uh, the uh, reception by journalists uh, of this film Crash. This film festival conference is also referenced in other supplements like the commentary track and also like the BFI lecture. So it's nice to see the actual... Uh, thing itself that's being referred to elsewhere. 
uh, here uh, in this supplement. So the CAN press conference, approximately 37 minutes. And then we have what's known as the press kit footage, which is a compilation of interviews uh, at the time. So archival based interviews uh, assembled together, totaling approximately eight minutes. And this is also very insightful uh, in terms of presentation of information about the film. And then we have a section of the supplements, which is referred to as trailers for the US trailer and also the international trailer. And then we have the insert which is taken out here. Now, it, the insert is one of these things where it's a fold-out poster where we have the image of the, the poster art uh, on one side, and then on the other side we have uh, details of the release, production credits, and the essay. And so, um, I am, I've said it before and I'll say it again, I'm not a fan, uh, to be perfectly honest, of the fold-out type of of inserts for a Criterion release. I'm much more of a fan of the staple booklet because, uh, specifically because the staple booklet, in my view, allows for more materials, both written and photographic, to be included as part of the overall package released by Criterion. Uh, so it, it allows for a more robust written material that accompanies any Blu-ray or physical media release. Uh, so in my view, uh, I would have liked to have seen a staple booklet rather than the fold-out. But that is in no way taking anything away from the brilliance that is the essay, which is by Jessica Kang, which is called The Wreck of the Century. This essay is so spot on and so well written. Excellent, excellent stuff. Uh, I strongly recommend it for anyone who is interested in this contemporary take on this film. Uh, so it's essential in that way. So the essay is top notch. So please check out this essay if you can, uh, which is, as I say, included, for example, in this uh, fold out leaflet that is included as the insert for the release by Criterion. So with that, I think we can say, or we can identify that apart from the brilliant essay that is included, we don't necessarily get from the supplements any contemporary or, or recently made take or perspective on the film crash. They are more or less perspectives taken at or around the time of the film's initial release, so in the late 90s. And so for anyone who might be interested in a more, let's say, uh, look back, you know, a perspective from or around 2020, looking back on the film from uh, a number of years prior, then perhaps this release is not for you, and you should perhaps consider other possible physical media options or the like. But be that as it may, the, uh, the takes that are uh, uh, presented in these supplements that are contemporary to the time are themselves essential, and from my point of view, I don't think they have changed in their essence. Uh, I think we can see, of course, that the film Crash does figure into the overall filmography of David Cronenberg that has, of course, since then expanded and developed well after 1996, as we know. So perhaps we are not getting that kind of discussion uh, in the context of, say, the Criterion supplements per se. But we are getting the great insights from Cronenberg and company uh, that are enveloped or included in, say, as I say, one of the key elements, which is the commentary track from Cronenberg himself. And those insights, I think, are more or less constant, which therefore makes these uh, supplements in that way uh, current. So uh, we can look at it that way. And so if you're interested, therefore, in these types of supplements, looking at it from that perspective, they might or might not be for you. Uh, once again, the choice is ultimately yours. I should say finally that uh, I've mentioned before, and I'll say it again, I think one of the ultimate ways to, to explore this work is by an exploration of the book itself. And uh, of course, the book uh, comes first in the chronology. And so, uh, and it's the basis for the film. Uh, so in many ways, the film could not exist without the Ballard work. And so that makes the Ballard work uh, from various uh, points of view essential 
and uh, uh, a, a, perhaps a fundamental, and it is, it's a fundamental work in the context of a discussion of this subject matter. And so for anyone who, as I say, is interested in the subject matter of Crash, but has not yet explored the ballad work, I cannot stress enough how important I think the uh, reading of that work is uh, uh, because of the elements that it brings uh, in and of itself, in its own right, as a work of art uh, uh, by itself, which it is. Uh, and uh, uh, so there's that component, which I think is a fundamental and primary. Also, of course, with regard to how it connects with the David Cronenberg film, which, we, as I say, we get some glimpses of and some insights uh, into. Uh, in the commentary track and the BFI lecture. But if anyone is interested in the further exploration, of course, the place to go is the work itself. So uh, um, I strongly recommend that to anyone who may be interested but has, at, as of now, not yet explored such work. So with that, my friends, this is an exploration of the Criterion release of Crash. Now, um, I may have certain reservations about the Criterion release specifically, and I do. And I've tried to express that in this video as clearly as I can. But when it comes down to the film itself, uh, I have also expressed what I think of the film itself, which is extraordinary. This is an extraordinary work from David Cronenberg, who is himself an extraordinary filmmaker and artist and poet. And for the reasons that I was trying to suggest in the first half of this video, I think this film is current. I think this film is bold. I think this film is brilliant. And I think this film is a consistent expression of Cronenberg's art, while also being, of course, challenging and confrontational in the best possible senses of those terms. Art is uh, capable of many things. One of those capabilities is, of course, confronting the viewer with concepts and suggestions and ideas that hopefully will lead us on our own personal journeys and our own personal explorations, whatever the final answers may be, whatever the uh, the ultimate conclusions may be for us, right? Whatever that may be, this film presents those in the bold, dynamic manner that is undeniable, unshakable, and poetically brilliant and profound and uh, very emotional. I would suggest too that this film, because it's about human connections, is a film that I contest is also uh, potentially very emotional and uh, thus making it for incredibly compelling viewing and it is one of my favorite works by David Cronenberg. This is the film Crash. Okay my friends, so that's it for now and so until we meet again please be happy and healthy and well and please keep on watching a lot of great great movies. Thank you so much for your time, as always. I very much appreciate it. Stay strong, stay safe, and cheers.